we can be praying about. We mentioned this morning in the announcements our Vacation Bible School and our Truth Trackers and our desire to see children come and be a part of that. And we want to lay that in front of you in faith, believing that you can do that. We haven't asked for thousands of kids. We've just asked for 36. And then 20 in truth trackers. In many respects, it's a modest request. But it's more than what we have to offer. So the answer would have to come from you. We pray that that will be the case. We also pray for Pastor Bailey this morning. You know his, um, the challenges that he is facing right now with uh, the physical problem of the kidney stone and the infection and would ask that you would minister to his needs and heal him and bring him back to us and we'll be grateful for that. We also have a, a number of families in our church that are traveling right now are not a part of, uh, able to be a part of what's going on here today and would ask that you would keep them safe. And for others who are not able to be here for one reason or another, and I ask God that you would bless them as well. Father, I've been reminded this week that we serve a God who delights in answering our prayers. The more unlikely, the better. And we've mentioned these difficult requests about Vacation Bible School and the need for kids and the need for workers and as we re relaunch Truth Trackers in August. We're asking that you will bring these unsaved kids and that some of them will come to know Christ and we're not asking that so that we can toot our own horn. God help us not to do that. Instead we're asking these things so that the name of the Lord Jesus would be magnified and that you'll get the credit. That's what we want and I pray that that'll be the case. We pray for our partners in ministry. We think of Dan and Christine Grings and their ongoing service to you in the De Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, Dan and Christine have been doing that for a long time. They've been in the same kind of ministry for a long time. Uh, for Dan, he grew up there, so it's all of his life. Uh, Christine didn't grow up there, but she's been there now for in excess of 40 years, and I just pray that you'll Bless their ministry. Bless the ministry of their children who have followed the, in their footsteps and would ask God that you would give them fruit for their labor. We also pray for Bruce and Sherry Walton, pastor at Fairview Baptist Church in Denver, as they meet this morning. I would ask that you would bless their time together as they are around the word of God and fellowshipping with one another. Pray for Ryan Tustin as he uh, continues his studies and points toward uh, what you have for him after school is over. would ask that you would bless his life and bless his coming ministry, that he would have an impact for Christ all out of proportion to just who he is, and that you'll, you'll just make him a, a shining light in the community in which you place him. We pray for our representatives in uh, civic duty, for, for our Congressman Doug Lamborn and for our state representative uh, Dave Williams. Pray for our mayor, John Southers, and for our city and county first responders, and for our city council persons, Bill Murray and Michael Malley, and for our county commissioner, Carrie Geithner. These are people, Father, who have been given responsibility on the local, state, and, uh, and national levels who represent us. And I pray that you'll give them wisdom, that you'll help them as they make decisions. Thinking of our first responders, that you'll keep them safe as they work day in and day out to protect us and to care for us, and we'll be grateful for that. Now, Father, remind us that a response of trust is far superior to a response of unbelief, that a response of trust in you is better than a response of trust in ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to open your Bibles to John chapter 10. We're going to finish the chapter this morning and finish the story because the story actually starts in verse 22 uh, where we were last week but we're going to pick it up at verse 31 and the title of this morning's message is two responses and the reason we've said that is because in this passage there are two responses there are two ways that one can respond to jesus and that's what we're going to see 
in this situation. As I mentioned, this is a continuation of a story. Last week's message was in verses 22 to 30, and it involved a tense exchange between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. If you'll remember, Jesus is walking in the temple, and the Jewish leaders surround him, sort of ambush him, uh, during the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah. And they demanded that he state in no uncertain terms whether he was or was not the Messiah. Tell us plainly, they said. Well, Jesus responded by saying, well, I told you in word, and I've showed you in works, in miracles. And then he showed how he and the Father worked together to secure our salvation and asserted, I and my Father are one. Well, how tense was this exchange? Well, when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, the Jews picked up stones that they intended to use to stone Jesus to death. That's pretty intense. They hated him. And they wanted him dead. Everything they said was for the purpose of trapping Jesus, discrediting Jesus, accusing him of some horrible crime, and getting rid of him. To them, everything Jesus said was suspect. They thought that if Jesus was out of the way, then they could get back to normal. What was normal? Well, they could control the people. They could schmooze with the Romans. They could live like kings at everyone else's expense. That was normal for the Pharisees. Well, they weren't the only ones who understood the nature of this conversation. Jesus knew full well what was going on. He knew they were out to get him. So the conversation continues in our text this morning, and it's just as ugly as it was last week when we saw it. So we're going to see two reactions to Jesus in these verses. The first one is, is in verses 31 to 39, and it's rejection. The other one is at the end of the chapter, and it's the opposite. So verse 31 says, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you being a man make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. So when Jesus said, I and my Father are one, the Pharisees got what they were looking for. And what they were looking for was a statement that they thought they could use to accuse Jesus of blasphemy in order to get rid of him. And they were right, sort of. A normal man making the claim that Jesus did, that he and the Father were one, would be uttering blasphemy. I thought you were just saying amen. If Jesus were any other man, they would be justified in leveling that charge. Because God is not a man. And no mere man is God. The difference is Jesus was not a mere man. He wasn't any other man. He wasn't is the son of God. Now that said, the Jewish leaders didn't believe that. And so they reacted with violent intent. Very much the way they reacted when Stephen nailed them. Later in the book of Acts, and they picked up stones and they followed through. They stoned Stephen to death. Well, they picked up stones here, and they weren't going to waste any more time on this Nazarene, even if it cost them dearly with the Romans, because the Romans would have come around and said, what are you doing killing somebody? You don't have the right to do that. That's our job. They were going to kill him on the spot. That's verse 31. And then in verse 32, Jesus challenged their reaction. The challenge that he threw out to them was based on the miracles that he had performed. And he said, many good works I have shown you from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me? He called his miracles good works. 
Jesus didn't perform spectacular stuff just for show. He didn't go on TV and say, I'm a magician, let me show you all my tricks and see if you can figure them out. That wasn't Jesus. He did good works. That is, the things he did benefited the people to whom he did them or for whom he did them. He repeatedly healed. He raised people from the dead. He walked on water and you say, ah, see, he, just did, he did some things just to show how cool he was. What happened when he walked on water? That impacted the faith of his disciples. It was still a good work. Even though nobody was healed in that process. He cast out demons. He, he did, he, and, and at times it just says he healed many. We have individual stuff like blind Bartimaeus and some of those kinds of things. We have individual reports of what Jesus did in the Gospels. But there are times that it just said he healed many. What he did had a positive impact in people's lives. They were good works. Jesus had mentioned back in verse 25, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So he turned their attention away from the comment about oneness, back to the powerful credentials and evidence of his Messiahship in the miracles that he had performed. And it was evidence. Now, he's going to come back to the oneness comment. He wasn't running away from it. Far from that. But he wanted them to see the inconsistency of their intent to destroy the Son of God who had done so much good for the people of Israel. These are the leaders of Israel. He's healing people all over the place. He's casting out demons. He's raising people from the dead, and they want to kill him. Now, there's one more aspect of this challenge that we should note. He says, which one of my miracles is worthy of death? That is, can you point to one of these good works that wasn't good? Is there something that I've done that you can say, we need to stone him for this? Just one, just name one. Everything I've done has been in complete accord with the will of my Father. Everything. Which one of these works do you stone me for? These aren't the words, but you can read behind, read between the lines, if you will. If your religion demands that you execute someone who has done nothing but good, who has done nothing except follow the Father's will, has been completely aligned with the Father, someone whose life has impacted so many lives for good, maybe you guys should rethink your religion. Well, they couldn't answer that, so they ignored it, much like the enemies of Christianity do today. Talk to people about the evidence for Christianity. They can't usually refute that. I say usually because some of them are pretty bright and they can come up with arguments, but they can't refute what, what Christ has done. They can't refute things like the resurrection. They try. Come up with all kinds of theories of what has happened. None of them hold water. So they ignore it. Now, this line of thinking from Jesus in verse 32 kind of caught the Pharisees off guard for just a moment, but they recovered pretty quickly and said, for a good work, we do not stone you. We don't want to kill you because you've done all these marvelous things. And no, we can't point to one that was bad. Your good works are not the reason we picked up stones. So we're just going to blow that off. We're going to ignore that. It's interesting that they did not dispute the claim of good works. Do you notice that? They didn't say, no, 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 no. These things you've done, they're not good works. They didn't say that. They said, no, we, we're not stoning you because of all the good things you've done. And, and no, we can't find one that's, that's not good. So tacitly, they admitted that Jesus had done good works. And they didn't want to go down that road. They, they wanted to get past that because to go down that road, they've got to admit some things that they don't want to admit. It doesn't fit their narrative to go down this road of what Jesus had done. All that the miracles said about Jesus was just so much fluff in their minds. And they refused to connect Jesus to the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. The things that were fulfilled in his life. They just don't talk to us about that. 
We just want to come back to your comment about oneness with the Father. So they say, but for blasphemy, and because you being a man, make yourself God. By the way, there, there are some people who say Jesus was not claiming to be God in verse 30. Well, the Jewish leaders thought so. That's precisely what they say in verse 33. You, being a man, make yourself God. They understood that Jesus was claiming deity. And by the way, he doesn't correct them on that. We want to stone you for blasphemy. It was what you said that angered us, not what you did. But they refused to believe their eyes. They heard something. They translated that into what they wanted it to say. And they saw all these other things. They, they saw a lot of these miracles. There were people from the Jewish leadership standing there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. How do you explain that? The guy's been dead and in the grave for four days. Instead, they focused on what Jesus said about himself. You being a man, make yourself God. But he didn't make himself God. He didn't have to make himself God. He was God. He is God. He would have been denying himself if he'd have said anything less. Was Jesus the son of God? Yes, he was and he is, but they didn't believe that. So they heard in his comments a blasphemous claim to equality with God on the part of a mere human. That's why they wanted to stone him. Now, beginning in verse 34, we have an interesting passage, and it's kind of hard to understand. Because it almost sounds like Jesus is equating himself with people in the Old Testament that God said, you're gods, plural. Here's what it says. Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? And that's, by the way, Psalm 82, verse 6. If you want to stick a finger in here and go back and look at that, you're welcome to do that. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. Now, the Jews revered the Old Testament scriptures, and in particular, the Pharisees, the Sadducees weren't too excited about anything past Deuteronomy. Everything else was just commentary as far as they were concerned. May or may not have been right. The Pharisees saw all of the Old Testament as the word of God. So they revered these Old Testament scriptures and taking them back to those scriptures put the Jewish leaders in a tough spot. We either have to deny what God said in his word or we have to deny um, what we're saying right now and we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. We don't want to be there. The passage Jesus quoted, as I said, is from Psalm 82, 6, and it says, I said you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. That was spoken of Jewish judges, judges in Israel, who were unrighteous men in positions of power, but who do not use their power in a right way. So if God spoke of mere men, even men who were unrighteous, as gods, Elohim, and children of the Most High, how is it somehow blasphemy for the one that the Father had sanctified and sent into the world to say, I am God and I am the Son of God. How is that blasphemy for him? It's a, this is a point of comparison that Jesus is making. Scripture, which cannot be broken, called men gods who simply received the word of God. Standing in front of the Pharisees was the word of God. How could they object when the Son of God, the word that was made flesh, is called God's Son? How could they object to that? These Pharisees were mere men, sinful men, and by the way, doing unrighteous things. So they really kind of fit the whole pattern of what we see in, in, in uh, Psalm 82. Jesus, on the other hand, was set apart, sanctified, and sent into the world by the Father. So the comparison served to point out the ridiculous position that the Pharisees were in. You're, you're denying the Old Testament scriptures in your effort to, to uh, kill the Son of God. And then Jesus came back to his works in verse 37. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. You guys have been watching me for some time. 
You've seen with your own eyes what's been taking place. If what you've seen does not line up with what you know to be true of the Father, then don't believe what I say. Back to, you got one of these good works that, that you were going to stone me for? If, if this doesn't line up, then don't believe me. So once again, Jesus threw down the gauntlet. Prove that what I've done has been outside of my Father's will. Prove it. If my actions haven't lined up with my rhetoric, then by all means, start heaving the stones. But if I do, that is, if I do the works that my Father has sent me to do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. The evidence is there, gentlemen, even though you don't believe me, you don't believe what I say, take a look at the evidence. The evidence is right in front of your face. Your eyes are telling you that the Messiah has arrived. Your hardened heart is telling you you don't want to believe it. You need to trust your eyes. <laughs> a lot of times people say, I don't believe because I, I, I can't, my senses tell me that this isn't true. Jesus is saying, this is one of those times when your senses are telling you it is true. Now, we, last week and this week both, we see a tense exchange between Jesus and people who just steadfastly re refuse to believe him. But I see a ray of hope in what Jesus is saying in verse 38. At the end of the verse, he says, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. I want you to believe. I want you to come to the truth. I want you to be saved. I know you hate me. I know you think that I'm wrong. I know you are scared of what's going to happen if, in, if, in fact, I turn out to be the Messiah. I know all those things. I still want you to believe. It's interesting to me that in that phrase, even though that, this phrase makes them mad again, <laughs> in that phrase, Jesus is saying, I have something for you. I have a gift for you. All you have to do is believe. He wasn't willing that any should perish. He was still wooing these Jewish leaders. He would very soon weep over Jerusalem because of Jewish unbelief. This is the same Jesus who back in John 3 said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. And he's looking at these Jewish leaders and saying, I want you to know and I want you to believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But his plea fell on deaf ears. Therefore, it says in verse 39, on the basis of what he had just said, the plea, I want you to believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me. On the basis of that, they sought again to seize him, still holding the stones that they had picked up, they tried to capture Jesus in order to murder him. Nothing he said made any difference to them. His good works did not sway them. The fact that they couldn't find a single one among all those people who were around him, they couldn't find a single one that they could say, ah, ha, this was not a good work. His impeccable logic did not crack their resolve. His gentle response and his desire to save them did not impact their thinking. They still wanted to kill him was full circle after jesus spoke they hated him just as much wanted to see him dead just as fervently and were willing to risk deep trouble with rome just to be rid of jesus they circled all the way back from verse 31 right back to where they started with murder on their minds the end of verse says but he escaped out of their hand the text doesn't tell us how but jesus got away from the ambush the encirclement and left his fuming antagonists all behind. These enraged men weren't able to carry out their desire to kill Jesus. Yet. Their time would come. This wasn't it. 
So that's the first response, a response of rejection. But there's a second response that starts in verse 40. It's the response of reception, the response of belief. Verse 40 says, And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. So Jesus left Jerusalem and headed east, beyond the Jordan River to the place where his public ministry began, where he was baptized by John, where John had been involved in his public ministry, where that ministry of John the Baptist flourished at the first, where his preparation work, his work to prepare the way for the Messiah, where that work began. The Apostle John, who is writing, tells us he stayed in these familiar Surroundings. We don't know how long. It doesn't say that he stayed for a day or two days or ten days or two weeks. It doesn't say. But I get the sense from the passage that he settled down there for a while. Because the way it says, he went there where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Here, the pressure of religious opp opposition was less intense. Here, there was time to pray, time to minister. Time to teach. Here the people who wanted to know him gathered. In fact, verse 41 tells us, Then many came to him and said, quote, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. John didn't do miracles. You can go through the scriptures and when it talks about John the Baptist, you don't see miracles from John the Baptist. Instead, John pointed to Jesus who did miracles. In fact, when, when John sent his disciples and said, are you the one we're looking for or should we be looking for somebody else? Jesus said, think about all these miracles that I've done. All the things that fulfill prophecy, particularly in the book of Isaiah. Think about all these things. Tell, go back to John and say, this is what Jesus has done and that'll calm John's fears. John didn't do miracles, but he pointed people to Jesus who did. John spoke about Jesus, and Jesus fulfilled the things that John said. So in the setting where John used to baptize, where all of Judea came out and said, what's going, around, what's going on out here? And John preached repentance, and they repented. And they said, we, we have not been living the way we should. We have not been looking for the Messiah in that place. Also the place where Jesus' ministry began, these people, these same people who had been out there before, remembered what John said about Jesus and saw that it had come true. They saw Jesus in action. And they remembered John's testimony. And they heard Jesus for themselves and they put two and two together and they said, this is in fact the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. And verse 42 says, and many believed in him there. What a sharp contrast between them and the self-righteous Jewish leadership. The men who had all the background to recognize the Messiah blew him off, rejected him, wanted to kill him. The people who opened their eyes to who Jesus was and what he had done believed in him out in the wilderness, away from the congested city and all the fights and the fickle crowds, in the quiet of a desert place, people came to Christ. And that is often how it is. The hustle of everyday life shuts out the still small voice of the master. We get too busy. We just do. And we don't take time to hear God's voice. When we do take time to hear God's voice, even though it's still a small voice, it can have a loud impact in our lives. Do you spend time alone with God? Just you and him? Do you open his word and read? Do you talk to him in prayer? You know, Prayer is not supposed to be, and, and matter of fact, in the passage we read this morning from Mark, <clears throat> you have these people making long prayers as a pretense. Prayer is not supposed to be show and tell. I'm going to show you how I pray, and I'm going to tell you what a great guy I am. That's not prayer. 
Prayer is a conversation with God. Reverent, respectful, but it's a conversation with God. It's where we talk to God and share our heart and open our heart. The book of Psalms is a whole bunch of prayers. These people got out away from all of that. They got alone with God. And they heard him. And they responded and they believed. Well, you too have a choice. You can trust your own sinful instincts. A lot of the world does. You can trust your heart that is full of deceit and wickedness, as Jeremiah told us. You can trust the experts in our society who tell us that all of this is a bunch of baloney, all of it is a bunch of misinformation. And you can turn away from the Savior. Or you can come to him in simple faith, believing that he is who he said he was and that he will save you from your sin. Rejection or belief. And let me say that's not just on the basis of salvation or for the purpose of salvation. Once you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you will still face rejection or belief for the rest of your life. Am I going to accept what God's Word says or am I going to reject it? Am I going to go my own way? Am I going to live a life that is for Christ or am I going to live a life that's for myself? So you have a choice. It's a choice that you'll continue to have to make, but it's a choice. Am I going to reject? Am I going to believe? What's it going to be? Let's pray. Father, thank you for even the accounts of these verbal battles that took place. Because in them we see truth that stands in tar stark contrast to falsehood. And in them we see the heart of our Savior. It's impressive to me that in the midst of this ongoing fight where the people on the other side desperately want to kill him, that Jesus is still reaching out and wanting to save them. Teach us to have that kind of compassion for the people around us, even some of whom don't like us. We might have an impact on them for Christ. Father, if there's somebody here who doesn't know the Lord, I pray that they'll see in the passage that we just studied the heart of our Savior, that he wants people to come to him for salvation. And that includes us. Use this passage as you see fit in each one of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.